Welcome back to the channel, everybody. We've got an epic episode coming up. That's right, it's gonna be a big one. But first, huge thanks to Turn 14 Distribution for sponsoring this entire video series. Without them, we would not be building cars to this level with all these great parts. And of course, headed to the dyno, which is what is happening today. But before we do that, there are a couple things that need to be addressed. And the first one is underneath. It's hard to show you exactly how close it is, but you can see that rubber right there is way too close to the outlet pipe. Where, you know, it might be okay for street driving, but a bunch of hard pulls or anything that's gonna create a lot of heat is going to likely melt that. And uh, one of you actually pointed that out in the comments. So I'm going to address this with some heat shielding here. And here's my solution, some DEI fire sleeve. It's the radius is actually pretty perfect for that rubber tube. However, at the top, it does kind of like open up and go inside. So what I've done is I've, I've cut it open here and I think I should be able to slide it up and, and just cover it that way and it'll still protect it. So let's put this on and see how it looks. That looks to be pretty successful. You can see I do have full coverage on it. And here you get a better look just how close it would have been now with that heat sleeve. I think we're gonna be just fine. For those of you wondering what that rubber tube is, it's actually a, an AC vent tube. It's a drain tube for any condensation or moisture that builds up in the condenser. Next up here, I'm gonna address what so many of you uh, did not like, and that is the fact that these wheels and tires were, were poking out. Uh, I certainly think it's a look. I'm not necessarily super fond of it either. I do like my wheels and tires to be inside the fender well rather than outside the fender well, but if there's a car that can pull it off, it is certainly the S chassis. However, we are a little bit worried about rubbing, so I'm gonna show you what I have for a solution. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is a lot of you commented, why didn't I go with a set of TE37 or a very, very common and typical wheel that gets put on these vehicles? And that is exactly why, because they're oh so common. I actually do have a set of TE37 sitting in the office, but I figured, you know what? Like, They've just been done over and over. What we like to do here is show you wheels that a lot of people don't run on S chassis or other vehicles just to give you a, a, a bit of a different taste of what's out there and what's possible to do. I personally really like the way these wheels look on this car. Now with the tint and everything else, like th they really do set this vehicle off and, and give it a good proper theme. I know some of you didn't like the color again. It's all personal preference and I get that. But from a wheel standpoint, we do like to show you different wheels that are available out there, not just the same old thing, because truthfully, I am a little bit tired of seeing T37s on S chassis. Here is the solution to our problem, a more narrow tire. This is a 225-40-18, which is the perfect fitment. I think this is what everybody runs on their S chassis, a 225 stagger setup with a 255 in the rear. So let's bolt this thing on and see what it looks like. You can see it now has way less tires sticking out, as you can see on this one here. So it's gonna give us the ability, I think, to camber this in now and get rid of that poke. Here it is, all mounted up, and you can see the fitment is perfect. Look at that, I did add a slight amount of camber. Um, the 225 versus the 255, the rolling diameter is exactly the same. Obviously, the stretch is what makes it different, but, I think the look is pretty damn near perfect. I can't believe I'm saying this coming from a track guy who loves a square look. I think just the, the camber, the, the tire size, the little bit more stretch, this truly looks like a, an S chassis now and I understand why this is such a popular setup because it just, it looks right. You kind of have more fat tire in the rear, less up front. You can see on this side here, this is what we are coming from. And it's certainly a different look. It really, really is. It doesn't necessarily have that like pronounced dominance in the rear in terms of how the, the tire is just wider. And in the front, you can see that the, the struggle we have here is we had that poke and it stands the wheel up more, which I just, 
I, I don't like it. I didn't like it. And I think we did the right thing by setting it up this way here. I think we've dialed in our wheel and tire package quite well. We'll show you in a second with the beauties. Uh, the other minor thing that I, I don't know whether I want to do or not is uh, put these fresh new badges on the trunk here. Up front on the hood, I did put that silver, that Sylvia uh, lightning bolt emblem. I do love it up there. I kind of like the idea of that there and not keeping this on here because this kind of gives away what this car is, having Nissan and a, a Sylvia badge. Where right now, the people that don't know, and there will be a lot of people that don't know what this is driving down the road, won't know. They'll just have that S up there. And I kind of find this does add a bit of busyness to the trunk. This would live here, and then the Nissan logo would live like right here. So it is a little busy. I don't love it. I don't. So I think I'm gonna leave it off for now. Uh, the other thing we do wanna make is a bit of a, a taillight upgrade, or for some of you, it might not be an upgrade at all. Uh, these lights, I think, and there was a bunch of comments that people mentioned it too, they kind of give off the Pontiac Grand Am vibe. DP, what do, what do you they, think? They kind of do, you're right. They do, and if you don't know what those look like, go look up a, a Pontiac. Uh, Grand Am, or was it, yeah, it's a Grand, Grand Am. Prix Grand Prix? Grand Prix, I think it's a Grand Am. Anyways, just go look up Grand Prix or Grand Am and you'll see what we're talking about. They certainly have that kind of vibe, which uh, not GM's finest vehicle. And what we did actually is I had Richie paint these. These were usually uh, amber, so I had him paint those in red. And oh, another thing I should mention, a bunch of you commented, why did you not have this painted red and this one is painted red? This is actually how it comes from the factory with the, the reverse light. There's only one weird uh, clear reverse yeah, light in really here weird. and this side is not. So it is kind of mismatched in a weird way, but that's how it is. Anyways, let me show you what I've got for taillights. Here is the replacement taillight. Unfortunately, I don't know the brand. This could be a D-Max um, or, or the like. I bought them used a long time ago when I knew I was buying one of these and it came up locally. And uh, it's, it's a dramatic difference. It really is. It really, really is. Maybe it's just so dramatic right now that I am not 100% in love with it. Uh, when I, when I look at this taillight, I just see this weird bug eye look, you know, especially this upper portion here. It certainly just comes out. It's so much more pronounced now to me, but I do like that it's all black and red. So it has more ties more into like, you know, the, the, the theme of this vehicle where this side here certainly has the opposite where now it's got a ton of chrome up here, but it almost looks more modern. You know what I mean? It does look more modern, yeah. It kind of, I, uh, I don't know. Like, I, I like it, I like that side. We're going for an OEM Plus build, so maybe this isn't the right way to go. I, I, I'm, I'm literally 50-50 on this. Um, post in the comments, let us know what you guys think, which one you like better. I think at this point, let's just put these in DP just so people get an, uh, an, a visual of what it does look like with both of them in there versus, you know, one on so uh, the, the stock one on the other side. And then we'll, uh, we'll make a judgment call. These are easy to swap, so it's not a big deal. front fitment on the wheels now that it's on the ground. I think, again, it was the right call, is the right call, just to make sure the wheel is tucking under the fender. The right amount of camber too helps tremendously, I think, to make the look of the car look much better before where that wheel was standing up. So I just think all in all, it's it's quite an appealing package to me. The, 
the emblem on the front as well, just like that nice little hint of red from, a, from the front. It's like there's nothing else that really stands out other than the emblem, and I do really, really like that. And just the lines of this vehicle, man, like what a good looking car. Peak Nissan, in my opinion. You know, R34 GTR styling, uh, S15 styling, just so, so good. Not that the other cars, like S14 is great, S13 is great as well, R32, 33, all great looking vehicles. But to me, this is like peak Nissan after this, they kind of started going downhill. So I'm glad to have one of the, you know, last iterations of what I think is, is the, truly the best from Nissan. One of the small issues a lot of JDM owners are facing these days is how to bolt up license plates because the spacing on our North American license plates, as you can see, is different than what the Japanese ones are. And a company that's out of Vancouver called Night Runner International makes this really cool bracket. And this one is actually a tilt down license plate bracket. So it doesn't mount the, uh, the license plate straight on. I'll show you in a second once I get this in here. If I can see, look at this. I don't have this lined up here, DP. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, look at there. Let's see if that will be a little bit better. There we are. And you can see it does add quite a bit of that angle to it tilts it down so it's a neat look some of you may like it some of you may not uh, it's very JDM in my opinion so I found these um, license plate spaces essentially on Etsy and you can see they're 3d printed and all they do is just offset where the bolt lies from the the Japanese setup to a North American one and then you put your license plate in and look you've got the right spots it does include these tiny little screws, I think. Let's see if these guys go in here. I haven't used these in a while, but yeah. They're certainly smaller, but you can see, there you go, so. You can throw a washer on yeah, it. Yeah, you can make it look pretty, put a license plate cover, but it's certainly a, a quick and cheap and easy, you know, fix for what is relatively an annoying problem. S15 is on the trailer, which means one thing, we are headed to the dyno. Uh, the roads aren't terribly salty, which is good. Actually, they don't have any salt on them. We just had a bit of a, uh, a warm-up period, which is nice. So that's why we've opted for the open trailer. I still don't feel confident driving it just because you may get a little bit of, you know, road residue. This way, it's certainly going to minimize it, especially the undercarriage. And the one thing I want to point out is if you guys haven't watched and seen us use this Max tie-down, um, track system here. This has been kind of uh, life-changing for us in terms of loading a vehicle onto this trailer with, we had to put in these tracks here. And now as you can see, we have straps that lock into these tracks and they go over the wheel here. So, so there's another lock right here. And then it goes over the wheel and locks down into place here. And now this vehicle is not going anywhere. It's perfectly mounted like securely mounted through the the tires to the trailer so you don't have a lot of sway you don't have the possibility of like you know losing a strap and the, the car coming loose or shifting this system really is uh i think the best on the market and for us it's just made towing so much more relieving and less stressful because we know at the very least this car is not moving anywhere from the trailer so I'm just gonna do, get these uh, ramps loaded up here and then we're headed to the dyno. We have arrived at our favorite dyno spot, BMS Tuning, and we are almost ready to go. The car is getting strapped down here. DP, are we gonna do uh, predictions with what this thing's gonna make for power? I guess that's a tradition now, isn't it? Yeah, uh, man, I know absolutely nothing about SRs. <laughs> So uh, I'll just pick a number out of thin air and say 278. That's, that's, that's a big number. I always go big. You Th know. That is a big number. Uh, I'm going to say 262. I don't even know how much boost pressure we can push. I, I just don't remember. I know like 15, 60 PSI seems to be that magic number. So maybe like 262. Who knows, we may be able to make more. We'll, we'll find out. Forrest is gonna be uh, remote tuning this vehicle. So he's gonna be connecting soon. But uh, yeah, let's, let's ask some guys around here. See what they think. I'm gonna say like 230-ish. 230. From the uh, 
The strap master himself, yeah. Dr. Dre, says 230. Yeah. What a pessimist, I love it. You guys will recognize John, the owner here at BMS, and uh, although you're not really an SR guy per no. se, we're gonna ask you for a prediction. We give you a quick rundown of yep. the odds. Yep. So what do you think power wise she'll do? Uh, 275 wheel. Wow, close. I said 278. Right. Really? Yeah, and he was like in the 260s. 262 for me. And uh, what about Forrest? I don't know if we're gonna be able to hear you, Forrest, but yell real loud and give us a number. For, for, for the money, let's say 268. 268. All right, so I'm coming in the lowest yeah. here. All right. Well, Trey said 250. So oh yeah, no, he said 230. 230. He said yeah, 230. Yeah, so he's a he's a pessimist. All right. All right, gentlemen, let's get the game started here then. Yeah, let's do it. So first pull, we have already made 250 wheel. However, that comes with a catch. Uh, we are at 18 PSI of boost, which is too much. And only went to 5,500 too. Pete. And, and exactly at 55, uh, just under 5,500 RPM. Yeah. So uh, not looking so hot right now. And this is what I was a tad bit worried about, which is why we upgraded to that HKS actuator. So I think what we're gonna do now is we're gonna make the adjustment on the actuator, I'm gonna lengthen it out a little bit more and see if that reduces the amount of boost pressure we have. And if that does so, then we'll know that it isn't a, an issue with just overspeeding the turbo. So that's what we can hope, 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 hope that that's the case here. Simply put, I'm just going to lengthen this rod here. That's exactly why I didn't put the heat shielding on here. So just with a couple turns, we should be able to make a, a quick adjustment here. In our haste to get back to dyno tuning, we forgot to record a clip where I explained that the modification worked lengthening that rod did bring the boost pressure down to 13 PSI, which is exactly what we wanted as a base pressure to start from. And from there, Forrest would be able to increase the boost pressure through the boost controller. And we did talk about trying to, you know, make a Hail Mary pull at 18 PSI, but we decided that with this being a fully stock block, meaning there are no head studs, no gasket, uh, it would be a little bit risky and something that wouldn't really be worthwhile running long term. Um, so we did dial it back and it's kind of settled upon 15 PSI. That's the, the final number, and uh, looks like PT won the bet, because I think you guessed 263. I, I think I said 262 or three, I don't know. You, yeah, yeah. You were very, I can't very even remember well, anymore, so. DP, but I, I, see, I knew. I know my SRs. Considering you did all the work on this car, <laughs> it's only right that you, you guessed right. I think maybe Forrest had something to do with that too, but um, anyway, nice looking curve, and Forrest did a great job tuning the boost control. 
That's yeah. really where he spent all his time, wasn't it? He, he spent time sort of getting control of it. We made some adjustments, obviously, to that actuator. But and we should mention this was at uh, 15 PSI, right? That's right, yeah. It goes Anymore, it was... Trails, yeah. like the low 14s, closer to red line. And uh, he played around with timing a bit, but it really basically had no effect, did it? Not really, no. We lost like a little bit of power if he pulled a degree or two. It gained even less than that if he put a degree in it. So, uh, man. This is a good r r uh, conservative setup to a certain extent, yeah, right? Yeah, it's a nice pump gas tune where you're going to have a very safe setup, I think. And I think what was interesting, John made the point that we should show people the initial pull versus this final pull to, to show really what the boost control tuning did. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is so. This is the final, but the red is the, the red is the initial. So it looks like it was going to start climbing, which was not good with the little turbo and the the stock motor. But down here, this is where the big gains are. This is where you feel it on the street. I mean, in, in this area, you're talking you went from 209 foot pounds to 235. Right. Wow. You know, 25 foot pounds of torque, uh, and that kind of carried you know more or less from you know 20 3800 RPM up to you know 5000. That's yeah. a that's kind of your, your mid-range It's a sweet power, spot of right? the power yeah, band, yeah. Definitely. That you're gonna feel on the street and 100%. really add a lot of fun and drivability. Just goes to show that, you know, you can actually make a lot of gains with a boost controller and a proper standalone ECU, right? Yep. Yeah, for sure. And, a, you know, a smart guy on the keyboard and a little dyno time and you're, you're all set. So, uh, all in all, I think that's a really nice stock SR20 power curve, isn't it? Like, what else could you ask for, PT? Yeah, no, I, I, I dig it, man. I think this is exactly where we were gonna end up, and, and we did, so there you go. Nothing was broken today. No rockers were chucked, no SR20s were harmed. All right, well, I should thank uh, Forrest from Link, who did the tuning, and of course, John and everyone here at BMS for letting us use their dyno and uh, pulling the button over there to reset the, uh, <laughs> the yeah. brake. We were, we were having some difficulties, but a good time was had. And uh, if you guys need any dyno time or if you want to build a uh, no prep LS powered drag car, come to BMS DNA. These guys will build anything for you, but they seem to be specializing in no prep drag cars these days. Uh, anything LS basically is kind of our specialty. Yeah. yeah. So someday we got to build an LS car, PT. What are, what are we going to do? It's coming. G8, G8. I want to build a G8. G8 with a Holden conversion? Yeah, you betcha. Yeah, let's do it. All right, guys. Well, there's one last thing left to do. I know we all want to see this happen, and that's for, uh, for us to take this car I went on a quick drive because, well, we don't want to rob you guys of that. We just put this thing on the dyno, it's pretty awesome. And we want to know how it feels like to drive, but, um, well, we do, we do have a problem. That problem is, hey, we're in Canada and it's winter and look at this. Another snowstorm is coming in and you can judge by the tundra what it's going to look like out there if we do try to drive this vehicle right now. So I'm just gonna have to say I'm sorry, it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen right now as we are kind of wrapped on this video series. And that means, you know, if we do get a break in the weather, which is highly unlikely, and there's gonna be salt down now on the roads. So we may bring this car back in the springtime to give you that test drive. Please post in the comments, let us know if you enjoyed this, you know, OEM plus build. We kind of simplified things in this one. Didn't muck with the engine, didn't muck with the turbo, just bolted stuff on. And truthfully, I'm really, really digging this car. This is, I think, going to be the next kind of like phase for a lot of us building cars that we can really just street drive and enjoy. That, you know, they're not loud, they're they're comfortable, and they don't make obscene amounts of power. Kind of enjoy it for what it is, that the true ethos of like an S15 from Japan in this era would have been much like this car. Also, if you do like the content, think about subscribing and think about hitting that like, and head over to Patreon to check us out there. We certainly appreciate all of the support you guys give us. So thank you so much for watching, and we will see you in the next one.